Well, joining me today on Talking Pints, all the way from the USA, is Candace Owens. Candace, welcome to Talking Pints. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. First today. So, <laughs> so, I first met you. You were a student. It was at the back of a hall, I think. Donald Trump was about to speak. It was at a big conservative conference in, in Maryland. Um, and it's amazing. You know, you've gone from being a student who was attracted to conservative politics and you've become this big controversial figure in the USA. So the first thing, I remember a lot of English people watching this and they will have seen uh, all the news stories about how America is incredibly divided, that the black community support the Democrats and the white community support the Republicans. So just tell me, what is it about the conservative movement? What is it about Donald Trump that really got you involved in politics? You know, for me, and, and I'm so happy to share this with this audience in particular, is that there's such a lack of understanding of what's actually going on in America in terms of the race conflict. Um, and it, it is purely manuf manufactured by the media, um, and it is encouraged by the Democrat Party who wants people to vote based on emotionality and on no basis of fact. And in, in particular, seeing the protests uh, that were going on in the UK about racism and Black Lives Matter, an organization um, that is not for black Americans, it's an organization that raised billions and billions of dollars of which zero but it says it is yeah yeah billions and millions of dollars from white people that feel guilty and believe that there's you know racial oppression in america for black americans because the media tells them so and of course the media never lies like as you know the media never ever lies um and what it does is it funds um white people uh, the money never goes to black america so billions billions of dollars raised for black lives matter uh, not a single black school built not a single black building built up not a black neighborhood that was built up uh, but many more black people arrested and sent to prison in these riots, more black people died in these Black Lives Matter riots, but at least the white people felt good when they gave the dollar to Black Lives Matter. So it's a political scam. But there are a lot of poor black people in America. There's a lot of poor white people in America, there's a lot of poor people, period. Um, and uh, there's definitely such a thing as economic privilege. There's no white privilege. America is a country that, uh, no matter where you come from, you can make something great of yourself if you're willing to work hard and stay out of trouble. And um, unfortunately, right now, uh, there's this idea that if you are black, you can't become successful in America. Um, and part of that is a racist it, idea, by the is, way. This is the victim. This is the victim mentality, and, it, and, it, and it's cancerous, right? Um, because if you keep telling somebody that they're a victim and that they are, you know, stuck inside of this idea of being a victim, then they become their own oppressor. When you believe that you are a victim, you become your own oppressor, right? Because you say, why, why should I try? I'm black. Um, and you know, my story is very much, I came from nothing. My mother didn't even graduate high school. Uh, my family grew up very poor. And I made it in America because I had a grandparents who never handed me an excuse. You just gotta get up and you have to work. And now an English husband. And now an English <laughs> husband, yes, yes. So. But he's living in America with you, obviously. And you've got a young child. We do. Which is great. So there's a family life, but there's a sort of media life. I mean, that's where you are now, isn't it? A burgeoning media career. Yeah. And is that, is that mostly online? Do you appear much on the big TV shows in the States? How does, how does that mix work? Yeah, so I do, you know, I have my own show with The Daily Wire, and I'm on Fox News once, twice a week. Um, and people, primarily the young people follow me just on Instagram, uh, on Twitter, because they just like to hear an opinion they haven't heard before. You know, people mean well when they get behind things like Black Lives Matter. They genuinely do I mean well. I think that's right. I think most of the people who turned up on the streets mm -hmm. thought, you know, we want to we live in a, a fair society. But, I mean, I felt they were being used as pawns. Of by, the by facts are there. If, if people would like to look at the facts, they can look at the facts and actually see that black Americans know we're not just being gunned down for walking down the street. Uh, police officers don't just see us and gun us down. In fact, a police officer is 18 and a half times more likely to be shot by a black man than the other way around. And in America, by rate, if you look at the numbers, white American men and Hispanic men are killed at a higher rate than black men. People yeah. just don't know Yeah, this. no, I, I, I know. I've seen those numbers. And, yeah. And, and yeah, that narrative just hasn't got through at all. It hasn't gotten through. Just hasn't got through in any way. But Brexit inspired you. It did. Because uh, it inspired your own political movement. Just Brexit. Blexit. Explain Blexit, please. So I saw you at CPAC, and I was actually depressed before I saw you because uh, the doors had closed, nobody knew who I was, um, and I was going to miss Trump's speech, and so I had to go backstage, uh, and I had a pass that put me backstage, and I was like, I'm going to miss Trump's speech the first time I'm going to see him speak, and I walk into the room, and I see you, and I'm like, oh, it's Nigel Farage, he's Mr. Brexit, and then I went, oh, 
That's exactly it. There needs to be a Blexit. There needs to be a black exit um, from the ideals of progressivism. There needs to be a black exit from this victim narrative that has become so poisonous. Um, and that is, it is based on a fundamental lie. And so I created the movement uh, to bring conservative principles to the black community, uh, to be a spokesperson for them. Because in, in America and beyond, if you are a black person, you are not allowed to be conservative. You know, you are caricatured, you are lied on by the media, yeah, you are attacked. And, and yet, a large number of black people voted Republican, I think in the last two elections, that had for a long, long time. So this, this Donald Trump figure, who I've got to know pretty well over the years, and I like him, you know, I mean, I've, I've, I've made no bones about that, and I've perhaps been his most consistent supporter on this side of the, the pond, uh, you know, against the media who paint him out to be a monster. But you're personal friends with Donald Trump, and tell me why. Uh, you know, because it, when he was running, I didn't want him to win. And then I watched a speech that he gave while he was running. Didn't. You didn't want him to win. No. I was that same sleepy, oh, Republicans are racist. And I then I heard a speech he gave in Dimondale, Michigan in 2015. And uh, the scales fell from my eyes. He sat up there and he listed every statistic. Uh, black community, you've been voting for Democrats for 60 years. Why not take a chance on me? He said specifically, black America, what do you have to lose? Look at all of the ways you've already lost, right? What's, yeah. it, gonna, what's it gonna take for you to just give me a chance? And I went, wow, uh, that's a, about as good an argument as any. We're not winning, so why not take a chance on something different, you know? Um, and I watched the way the media, who I had trusted at that time, spun what he said and lied and said that he was saying all black people were poor, that all black people were criminals, and it's not what he said at all. Or Mexicans, yeah. are, me Mexicans are drug dealers yeah. and rapists. He's a racist, or... he's an avowed racist. And I said, why are you lying to me? I just saw what he, I actually watched the speech, so I didn't watch the interpretation, I watched the speech, and I said to myself, is it plausible that black Americans and, and racism is being used as a theme to turn black America into single issue voters? And as I dug more, I found that the answer was yes, and I began watching, you know, Know, news organizations I would have never read growing up. I would have, because I was taught in school that the Republicans are racist, so why would I ever watch Fox News? Why would you ever watch it? Why would you ever listen to these people? Yeah. And I was shocked to see that these people were actually telling you the truth. Um, and that statistic, the, the statistics lined up with what they were saying. Um, and that, in fact, the only oppression that I had in my life was a mentality um, that was taught to me. For, through the public education system that well, it's very, No, it's a very positive message. It, it is a very positive message. But Trump himself, you know, and we can look back at the election, we can look back at the 6th of January and all the rest of it, but this narrative that the election was stolen. Mm. Now, look, I have seen postal voting, early mail-out ballots, as you call them. I've seen postal voting in this country, which Blair brought in 20 years ago. I've seen it abused on a wholesale basis. I know that it's unreliable. But there's a problem here, isn't there? If Trump and the Republicans keep talking about an election that is now nine months ago and somehow believing that audits are going to change the result of that election, I mean, it's, it, it isn't going to happen, Candace, is it? I, I don't believe it's going to change the results of the election, but I do think that the audits, that the audits are incredibly important uh, because it may not change the results, but it will change the mentality of a lot of people who actually see it for themselves. If, if you go through and you're able to show that these mail-in ballots, um, you know, we, we, we radically here. transformed the way that we did over, over COVID, you know, and, yeah. and you shut everything no, down. That's true. Yeah. All of that's true. And certainly there were turnouts in inner city districts that have never been seen before in American elections. I get all of that, and I get, I, I get election integrity. I mean, the idea that uh, show ID when you vote is somehow racist in Georgia, uh, I mean, that's all beyond me. But here's what I see. The special election in Georgia, which took place after the elections, and it was by losing that that overall control of the Senate was lost. So it was a very crucial election. And the Trump message was, it's all a fraud, it's all dreadful. They've rigged the system against us. Oh, please vote for us next Tuesday. Right. And they were surprised when people thought, well, what's the point? And, and even registered Republicans didn't bother to vote. How does Trump, how does the Republican movement 
get beyond that because they're still there. Right. Well, I think what's happening right now is that what we're focusing on and thank, you know, thank goodness for federalism is state by state, the legislature is coming up and saying, like you saw in Georgia, uh, you now need ID to vote. And this is why the election integrity discussion is so important, right? Because you need the states to indivi individually say, we are not allowing this to happen. Uh, we need to make sure that people trust the election system because you're right. If people don't trust, there's no point in showing up. And, and based on last election, when they said, we're not even going to talk about election integrity, there was no impulse. There was, there was no incentive for a person to say, OK, well, I'll see you again in 22, 22 and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote. So this continued fight for election integrity, this continued state by state fight to change and say, now we're requiring voter ID. You saw this obviously in Texas play out. They Democrats literally got on a plane and fled Texas rather than allow uh, election integrity measures to pass. These are important things to the American people to see because nobody's foolish enough to believe that requiring ID to vote is racist from the same people that are telling us that they want us to have vaccine passports to move, right? Which requires ID to get the vaccine and to get a passport. I mean, it's, it's a foolish message. So allowing this to play out is good for the American people. And I think that it's actually pushed more people onto the side of realizing, hey, Democrats, if everything is above board and you re Joe Biden really is the most popular president that ever ran in American history, he got more votes than any president ever, including Barack Obama in 2008. When, and you could feel it on the, it was kinetic with Barack Obama. There's no question he was yeah, going to win, no, but allegedly, Biden. Huge, huge charisma, yeah. phenomenal Still have not speaker. seen Biden in front of an audience, just so you are clear. So people need to see Obama it. had something special. Whether yeah. you agree with his you, politics yeah. or not, I, he, yes. there was something magical he, about what he did. There was something magical about him. No question about well, that. Well, guess what? They say Joe Biden's more kinetic and magical. He's got more well, votes. Okay, fine. We'll accept that. I'm so gonna, why are you fighting election integrity to, truth and now? I'm going to come to Biden in a moment. So I was over in the States and we met and I was there. And DeSantis, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, is very, very popular. Is Donald Trump the right guy to run again in 2024, or is it too early? Uh, I think it's too early. I mean, the thing about uh, Ron DeSantis, everybody loves him, and, and everybody would love to see him be president. We know he's a fighter, right? We know he's not going to get into office and become somebody else. Um, but I'm worried, especially right now with COVID-19, the thing that like, that saved America from totalitarianism for you know perpetual lockdowns, state by state rights, and Ron DeSantis fighting and saying, I don't care what you say, we're done with masks, we're not doing forced vaccinations, and our kids aren't wearing masks. When one governor does it, it makes it impossible for New York and LA to stay locked down because people just leave. They leave. So they need to have compliance from every single state. So right now, he has been more effective as a governor in terms of protecting the rights of the entire nation than he would have been during the time that he was no, president. And he's, and he's very without popular. the House, without the Senate, he would have popular. been useless as president without the House and the Senate, right? <laughs> he has been amazing as a governor. So I would be loath to lose him as a governor right now when we are fighting the state by state battle. And can Trump unite the Republican Party around him if he wants to run again? I, I think he can. Yeah, I think he can. I think based on the recent polls of this week, um, what, was it 18 percent Democrats are, are, are regretting their vote uh, for Biden? It's an extraordinary number. Well, I mean, what's just happened in Afghanistan is is uh, a disaster. And that's an overused word, but it is a disaster, I think. And I I wonder being in London, whether you understand that America is not quite as trusted as it was a couple of weeks ago. Of course. Do you, do you feel that in any sense? It hasn't been trusted for the American people, uh, you know, since watch since Trump went into office and we really saw, you know, what the media was, what the machine was, yeah. what the uh, quote unquote deep state was, meaning like, you know, the perpetual investigations, the Department of Justice against his family, the corruption. You know, we've realized this years ago and this is what we're fighting when you hear that they're calling us domestic terrorists, you know, now the DOJ, everyone who disagrees with us as a domestic terrorist. And yes, I think in, in a way, as much of a disaster as it was, it was a necessary disaster because now the entire world sees what we are fighting in America. Well, I, I, it, it's been a big awakening. And finally, Candace, you know, you're a ball of energy, ball of fire, you work your socks off, when are you running for office? I right now have no immediate plans to oh, because I think I'm running. Everyone with ambition says that. I know, I really, I really don't. I mean, for me, I have, I, I'm in a blessed position. I say what I want everywhere, right? I, don't, I, I go around and I think that I change more hearts and more minds in my ability, you know, to not be boggled down trying to run a race, yeah. but going and then realizing that we're also fighting this fight online. You know, <clears throat> social media, what are these kids learning? Well, you know what? They're always on their phones. So they can be learning the crap, the communism in school, but you know what? They're always, they're always on their phones and they're following me and they're I'm starting to have it. this awakening. I'm not buying yeah, it. I'm, well, I'm it. not buying it. Candace, thank you for joining me on Talking Pines. And I have to say a cheers to my friend Adam, who is the biggest fan of this show. So Adam, if you're watching, I <laughs> I promise you, <laughs> Talking Pints with Nigel, I would say your name. <laughs> that was Candace Owens, and you're going to hear a lot more of her. And it was a great interview. She's very open, very passionate. 
She just didn't answer the last question correctly. She will be running for office in a few years' time. Of that, I have no doubt. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.